Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 22nd episode of Mastember March Madness. Today, we have Judith Shine from the University of Oregon and the Tallwood Design Institute, and she'll be presenting, I believe, on Tallwood Design Institute's work primarily. Is that true, Judith? That's right. Okay, thank you. Please take it away. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting on um, the Tallwood Design Institute's work and primarily focusing on um, how it impacts architecture and, and design. So as Greg said, I'm a professor of architecture at uh, the University of Oregon and the director of design for the Tallwood Design Institute. And the Institute is a collaboration between two universities and three colleges. Um, I'm at the University of Oregon's College of Design and we collaborate with the colleges of forestry, forestry and engineering at Oregon State University. Um, and because we have faculty members in architecture, interior architecture, uh, wood science and engineering, and in civil and construction engineering, about 35 to 40 um, full-time faculty plus others, we really cover virtually every aspect of um, timber engineering from product development to research and testing. And um, our mission, in fact, is to drive economic development and environmental stewardship through advancing engineered timber products in Oregon. And we do this through research, testing, outreach, and education. Um, and our basic operations are supported by the state legislature. We get about 3.7 million over a two year cycle. Um, and um, we also get funding from a number of other sources, including federal ones. Um, we get about a million dollars a year from the Agricultural Research Service from the USDA, which we give out competitively among our three uh, college faculty members. Um, and those grants are ranked by an outside um, group of industry members, architects, engineers, uh, construction professionals, developers, um, uh, people from the Forest Products Lab, um, and uh, government officials of all kinds. So the research we do is very applied and very geared towards advancing the industry. Um, we also have gotten a number of um, U.S. Forest Service wind innovation grants for our work. Uh, we To jumpstart some of the testing, we had an Economic Development Administration grant. We had a Business Oregon grant for um, starting um, an acoustic lab, which we're, we're developing at University of Oregon. And we also work with cities and counties in Oregon to essentially do uh, feasibility studies for design projects they'd like to see done in mass timber. So... This is our new facility. These photos are already quite old. We opened in October 2019, which seems about, I don't know, 12 years ago now. Um, and um, it's a brand new building. It's part of the forest um, education complex at the College of Forestry. Um, there's a new PV Hall, which is the new college's building, and our Emerson Lab, both designed by Michael Green Architects. And our lab has a huge strong wall, three stories tall, for doing structural testing. We have a BSA. Uh, CNC, which uh, does uh, both panels and columns and beams and, you know, smaller things. We have a Minda press. Uh, this is it before it was set up. It does up to eight by 10 panels and we can do all kinds of experimental work on it. And we have a KUKA robot um, that can do a number of interesting things with digital fabrication. Um, and um, in research and testing, again, the primary focus now is overcoming barriers to mass timber adoption. So we cover many areas, including structural and seismic performance, fire, building performance and human health, moisture, durability and adhesives, sustainability and environment, business and economics, and what we call design research. And uh, here are some random photos of fire testing, um, moisture testing, uh, structural testing, and acoustic testing. Um, we also um, engage in outreach and education. Um, we, you know, collate and synthesize research and testings for code officials and designers. Most of what we do is um, publicly funded and out in the public realm. We do have some NDAs that we do um, with private companies, but the whole idea, again, is just to get stuff out there, get information out there. We have some joint courses and programs for our two universities, and we're starting a new focus in mass timber design in our Master of Science in Architecture program, which we're launching this fall which we're very excited about. And the idea is to um, eventually convert it to a, a joint degree between uh, UO and OSU. Um, we have some certificate programs just starting in mass timber manufacturing construction. And we have a, um, a met critical mass timber meetup group um, that uh, originally met in person in Portland. Now we're virtual and online. We have over 700 members now, I think partly because it's virtual. Um, and it's um, peer to peer, 
um, kind of education. It's, it's mostly professional groups presenting on interesting topics, though we sometimes also have uh, research presentations by our faculty. We also um, started workshops for industry professionals. Uh, this is actually a picture of, our, of the results of our first one, November 2019. We'd planned several more that have again gotten derailed because of the pandemic, but we hope to start again in this, this November. Our first one had a truly interdisciplinary group of participants from architecture, engineering, construction, manufacturing. And um, in three days in our lab, we managed to design, fabricate, and build um, a CLT structure um, with at least one of the panels actually made right in our lab. And we hope to be able to do more of these exciting and fun events very soon. So we also recently um, formed a consortium of um, industry professionals. Again, architects, engineers, construction companies, manufacturers, um, with some support, which we're very grateful for from the USDA Forest Service. And earlier in this series, um, Ian McDonald's is the director of the Institute, uh, presented on the um, Oregon's mass timber manufacturing supply chain, which is another um, um, aspect of mass timber that we look at. Um, and that, that was done with Business Oregon. So why is Oregon so interested in our program and why do they fund it? Well, it's because of course, Oregon has a lot of forests and those forests mostly have Douglas fir. And as many people know, Douglas fir is is the best structural fir around. Um, it's grown in a few other places, though it's not it's native to us. Um, I know in France it's called Oregon fir, um, and that is true in several other places because again, it's it's closely associated with us. And it's been a huge part of the economy. We of course don't just grow it; we also cut it down and um, chop it up and make logs out of it. And this has been a huge part of the state's economy since you know before and since its founding in 1859. And uh, timber is just part of the culture. We have the Oregon Timber Trail. We have the soccer team named, or football to some of you, named the Timbers. And at the beginning of each game, they cut up a log and then hoist it up in some victorious display. Um, and we also have things like cocktail lounges called the Timbers. Anyway, it's definitely part of our culture. And even with um, some changes over the years, uh, we still have a really steady supply of um, timber, um, timber lands, both private and public in the state. Um, the Oregon Forest Research Institute um, has pointed out that we lead the nation in softwood lumber production, plywood production, and engineered wood product development, of which we at the Institute are a big part. Um, and as you can see, the OFRI believes like we do in the economic development and environmental stewardship potential of timber, but also in, in its possibility for social good. And by social good, that means job creation and we hope creating beautiful and affordable buildings of all types with mass timber. So job creation is really critical in Oregon because although we still have a big timber industry, the number of jobs in it in the last 60 years, even though the amount of timber has remained pretty steady, the number of jobs has dropped dramatically. And that's partly due to environmental regulations limiting uh, logging on federal lands, um, as well as, as, well as um, some state laws about this, but also automation, which has also reduced the jobs dramatically. Um, and there's another issue is that a huge amount of the log production, especially on um, private lands, in Oregon has gone, um, has shipped overseas, um, mostly to Asia. So there is some interest in the idea of keeping more of the logs in the state and using them for added value. Meaning if you can take those logs and make them into higher value products like mass timber panels, that would be a big win for the state. And again, it's one of the things the state is very excited about, about the Tollwood Design Institute doing. And, and we've had some success. The, the first, certified CLT producer in the US was D.R. Johnson in Riddle, Oregon. They were, they were a glue lamb laminator and they got very inspired by uh, the former College of Forestry Dean, um, Thomas Manis's um, discussions. And um, he did a big state summit on CLT trying to get it launched and our institute launched back in 2013. And Valerie Johnson from D.R. Johnson got very excited about this and decided to go all in. And they she had some help from Associate Professor of Wood Science and Engineering at OSU, um, Lech Mijinsky, who knows about CLG manufacturing all over the world. 
And they worked with USNR to develop the first American um, uh, CLT press, which you can see here. Um, and um, we had the, our Tallwood Design Institute had even more to do with the next um, uh, mass panel, mass timber panel producer in Oregon, which are uh, Ferrer's Lumber's mass plywood panels. And OSU Associate Professor of Wood Science and Engineering, Ari Sinha, worked on uh, with the students on virtually every aspect of that and testing on, on, on components, on um, connections, on seismic performance, life cycle assessment, and acoustics to develop um, this product. And Ferrer's built a huge new plant. They, they invested about $40 million and they have huge capacity for this very, very interesting new product. And you can see it here. This is actually in our own Emerson lab, which is one of the first installations of these are three inch mass timber panels, which went up incredibly quickly and easily on our, on our Emerson lab. And here you can see it under construction. Um, I do want to talk though about um, some of the archi architectural things that we do. And um, I, I um, lead the area which we call roughly design research, which is looking at ways that mass timber can be used in buildings in ways it hasn't been yet, um, at least in the US. Um, and some of these are actually projects that we've been asked to do. Um, so this one, the Springfield Mass Timber Parking Garage was something that I was actually um, asked to do by the city of Springfield. It was something that was thought of by the then mayor of, of Springfield, Christine Lundberg, who uh, the city was developing a private pro, um, private public partnership um, uh, in the city, a development called Glenwood. And the one building they were building was a parking garage. And since Springfield has, a, has both a current and huge history of um, timber manufacturing, um, Lundberg thought that it would be great if their one building could be a parking garage. And she approached me about doing a studio on this. And at the time, this was 2015, we knew of one other mass timber parking garage and it was in Sweden where there is no seismic issue. So we really weren't sure we could do it. And um, I originally had gotten into mass timber design when I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona in Southern California, working with um, Professor Michael Gersfeld, um, a structural engineer, um, who specializes in timber, not, not that common these days in the US. Um, and uh, we taught together down there and he has continued to work with me in all my studios remotely and in person up at Oregon. And so I called him and asked if it was possible and he laughed and said, well, I guess we're gonna call it an R&D studio and we'll see. So I, I worked with um, Michael Gershfeld and with Mark D'Onofrio, um, associate professor at the University of Oregon, whose background is also in architecture and engineering. And we had a lot of consultants and all these design studios that I do in Mass Denver involve a lot of consultants, just like the integrated groups that really deal with these projects efficiently um, you know, in real projects. So one of the things that we found was that, because you know, the internet is very useful, is that um, in New Zealand at the University of Canterbury, they developed new lateral force resisting systems for mass timber. Um, and this was after the 2011 Christchurch earthquake, which you know, had really been um, devastating for Christchurch. So a lot of concrete buildings there had actually done well in terms of preventing life safety for the most part. People could get out of the buildings, but they were not rebuildable. They all had to be torn down. It took forever to rebuild, which they're still doing. So um, some of the graduate students, PhD students at University of Canterbury um, were aware of some um, lateral systems that had been developed for percast concrete at um, University of California, San Diego, where they have a giant shake table. And they started applying these to um, mass timber, to uh, post and beam and to big um, LVL panels. And they developed what's, what's called a rocking wall or self-centering system, where um, basically you use some steel to allow big vertical panels to rock during um, a, a seismic event. Um, and you have energy dissipating steel connections that will take most of the energy. And if the seismic event is big enough, those are designed to break and they can easily be replaced. But the panel itself, unlike concrete, when it rocks will crack, the panel can be re reused again. And in fact, um, we designed some gar parking garages using these techniques. The city of Springfield was convinced that this was actually feasible and decided to um, hire SRG partnership, um, then the only firm in Oregon that had actually had any experience with CLT. They installed it in the uh, Elephant uh, Visitor Center in the Oregon Zoo. 
Um, and they actually used a number of the students' projects to take ideas to develop this project. And they used this um, idea of the lateral force resisting system. So um, this um, parking garage, as well as using um, this, this lateral force resisting ideas, used several others. Um, but um, we had faculty, Andre Barbosa, o OSU Associate Professor of Civil Engineering, led um, the Tola Design Institute involvement in testing this rocking wall idea in the United States. Um, you can see on the left, there's this multi-institutional um, uh, work going on. This was a two-story test in 2017 of what is going to be a 10-story test coming up very soon. Um, and um, this was testing the rocking walls, which you can see here, and the test was enormously successful, doing exactly what it was expected to do. And here you can see the first um, rocking walls going up in North America in our own OSU College of Forestry in PV Hall, which went up in 2017. So the structural issues were people are pretty confident about, but there are a whole bunch of other issues involving durability or moisture. In a parking garage, you generally want to keep it open air so you can have natural ventilation. And the question is, how do you keep the rain out? So the first of these studies, and there were three studies done, interestingly, one in each of our colleges. So the first one was done at the University of Oregon in our energy studies and building lab. And um, they looked at wind-driven rain, and they looked at a series of fin studies and wind tunnels, and they finally settled on doing coiled stainless steel mesh curtain because it would, in fact, allow the uh, rain to just run down it um, and um, uh, still allow and pull at the bottom and also allow natural ventilation to go through it. Um, and then there were a couple of other tests done that had to do with um, keeping the CLT dry. So we actually uh, met at one of the big mass timber conferences in uh, Portland. We met a Swiss engineer who was working on some parking garages in Switzerland. And he um, had come up with a, a three layer uh, system of waterproofing and advised against using concrete because he said it's, it cracks. And we didn't want to use concrete anyway because in fact it is very heavy and would add to the foundation. So um, uh, Kent Duffy was the senior partner at SRG who commissioned a couple of studies from us to look at this. So uh, Professor Lech Mijinsky ran the uh, waterproofing study looking at this material called Suprema. Um, and did flood tests for the CLT and it worked extremely well. And then assistant professor of civil engineering, Aridem Kaleri at OSU used their asphalt testing uh, lab to test asphalt um, on top of that surface and, and um, basically used a machine that would replicate, you know, a Ford uh, 150 driving and turning and grinding its tires. Anyway, all of this turned out to be very successful. And, and although we have not yet gotten that project built in the US, um, Kent Duffy and I have been consulting with a whole series of teams. Um, one, they're trying to build one in Toronto. One, they're contemplating one at, in Vancouver Island at the airport. We just talked to a team last week in, um, in Utah that is very interested. And we hear there are others in, in North America. So we are, we're very excited about the possibility of all this research in our various colleges um, leading to an actual construction. Um, we're also um, uh, sometimes uh, contracted with um, counties uh, to look at essentially feasibility studies for their projects in mass timber. So we did two courthouse projects, one with Lane County, which is where both the city of Springfield and Eugene, which is where the University of Oregon is, is lo are located. And one with Clackamas County, which is um, the county that is just uh, southeast of Portland. Um, and both of them, again, these counties have uh, forests, lands, big history of manufacturing timber products, and we're very interested in having their new courthouses um, showcase mass timber in interesting ways to show what this new material could do to get people excited about it. So those were um, uh, studios we did. The Lane County Courthouse was in two 2017, and Clackamas County was in 2019. And again, we hope to see some really great mass timber projects in civic buildings emerging in the Pacific Northwest. Then occasionally um, I, I take on in studio projects, uh, projects that nobody has actually asked us to do. And this was one of them. Um, Hayward Field at uh, the University of Oregon is um, known on campus as historic Hayward Field because that's where Nike was founded by Bill Bowerman and, and Phil Knight. Bill Bowerman was a track coach and Phil Knight was of course his track star student um, where he experimented with shoes uh, 
um, where the soles were made using his wife's waffle iron. So anyway, of course, um, Nike via Phil Knight invest heavily in our athletic facilities and uh, historic Hayward Field was slated for uh, replacement um, for, for new grandstands. So the original design was something that was in Harleen steel, which I thought in Oregon was crazy. So without being asked, I decided to do a studio where we looked at doing um, 70 foot cantilevers and a giant arch in wood. And in this studio, um, my students worked in teams coordinating virtually with Michael Gershfield's advanced timber design class um, uh, it, at Cal Poly Pomona, which were graduate students um, in um, civil engineering working on timber design. Um, because for anything this technical involving these um, these cantilevers, actual calculations really had to be done. So we actually got the head of um, the track and field um, uh, at U of O really excited about these projects, and Ken Duffy um, was excited about them. He's he's from SRG based in Portland, but the real project was going on in SRG Seattle office, and he made sure they got all of our uh, project drawings. So on the left, you can see the original proposed steel design and on the right, the new proposal, which is in fact what got built. And what you can see is it's not entirely wood. There's a steel box beam between the uh, glue lamb vents, but still at least we got partway there. And we, again, part of this is advocating how you can use mass timber in ways that people might not immediately think of. Again, advancing mass timber products. So I, I've also been working on a couple of other projects. One is on modular um, housing, and one is on modular grasslands, mostly with mass plywood panels, um, because you can use very thin panels, uh, three, four, and maybe even two inches on smaller uh, projects, which can save a lot of fiber. So we've been working with some local manufacturers. And um, for the classrooms, we've been working with Modern Building Systems in Almsville, very close to Ferrer's Lumber. Um, and um, they've gotten as far as putting mass timber panels, mass plywood panels in the floors of classroom units. And um, there's a manufacturer up in Portland, Mods PDX, who makes modular housing, who's also um, just now putting mass plywood floors um, into modular housing. So we're getting closer to developing a kind of homegrown industry that is using more and more of these panels in these modular um, installations. And um, these panels, of course, that are made in Oregon are getting put into kind, various kinds of modular startup projects um, in other places, certainly in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but I also wanted to talk about some of the research projects going on at U of O, which particularly interest architects and are done by architects. We have, we have some labs at, um, in our department. Um, we're, we're kind of a very building science -y oriented uh, um, architecture department. We've, we've been focused on sustainable design since the late 60s when John Reynolds uh, really started the program. So one of the projects we've been working on in uh, the UO Institute for Health in the Built Environment, uh, Professor of Architecture Kevin Vandenway Mellenberg is the director of that, um, is uh, getting to net zero energy design. And um, despite it being called mass timber, mass timber does not have the thermal mass of concrete. So one of the things that they looked at was the perception of thermal comfort with wood. And this experiment was done in um, our climate chamber, which is up in uh, the lab in Portland in the White Stag building. And what they looked at was the perception of how comfortable people were depending on what the interior environment was. And what they discovered is that a wood interior environment compared to virtually any other material resulted in a two and a half degree Fahrenheit forgiveness factor. What that means is that if it's cold, you can heat the room two and a half degrees less. And if it's hot, you can cool the room two and a half degrees less. And this and for the same degree of perceived comfort. And this is huge in terms of BTU savings. So another project that um, we've, had, we've had tons of questions about um, is about looking at biogenic carbon, um, carbon narratives for designers. And the leads on this are Mark Fretz, who's an assistant research professor for architecture in the Institute for Health in the Built Environment and professor of architecture, Alison Kwok. So um, Alison Kwok had led several LCA studies. And what we discovered from those is that depending on which LCA tool you use, 
um, you get very, very different results for how much carbon you're actually sequestering in wood. And it really is a question of what data goes in as to what is biogenic carbon. And there were huge numbers of questions about this um, uh, uh, for us from architects and their clients, like what's really sustainable? Where does the wood come from? How sustainable is it? And there are a number of competing narratives about this, even within our own colleges. So we funded through our Agricultural Research Service funding, a two-year study looking at this. We're about six months into it. And we hope to actually be able to produce a kind of guidebook about what biogenic carbon really is and how it can be um, considered in, in, in terms of LCAs. Um, so look for that another year and a half, we hope. Then some other projects are um, part of the Institute for Health in the Built Environment looks at, um, it uh, is, a, is a group called BioB or Biology in the Built Environment where they type genomes of indoor air. Um, but they have been doing this with um, uh, biomes. And of course, now they're looking at COVID-19 extensively. So they're doing a lot of projects that look at off-gassing for adhesives and other products, looking at coatings. Um, but they're also uh, looking generally at wood in healthcare environments, which is a very hot topic now. Um, and then another project uh, we're working on is developing an acoustic lab for testing mass timber assemblies, particularly to get them um, into residential um, applications where there are strict STC and ICC requirements. So um, along uh, with this, um, there are a number of joint projects that are going on um, that um, are looking at structural and, and moisture monitoring. And PV Hall itself is really a living lab. Um, and that monitoring is led by Associate Professor um, of Wood Science and Engineering, Maria Paolo Riggio. Um, over at OSU with some help from our energy studies and building lab at U of O. But we have also a number of other moisture studies going on. Ari Sinha at OSU is leading a huge study looking at um, what happens to the structural properties of mass timber when it gets wet. Because of course, you know, we like to think that wood doesn't get wet, but, but we know it can happen. And um, architects, of course, and clients are always asking us about fire. So Lech Muzinski um, at OSU conducted um, some fire tests looking at um, mostly seven ply CLT, discovering that in fact, it can have a two hour fire rating. And Erica Fisher, who's an assistant professor in OSU's um, uh, uh, College of Engineering um, is a fire specialist and has been looking, doing a, a number of projects, including looking at composite uh, CLT concrete panels. And we're getting a lot of data out of that, which is a great interest to the industry. We're also working on several um, projects that really have to do with looking at sustainable um, forestry and recycled products. So um, Lech Mijinsky and Maria Paolo Ruggio um, from OSU are heading up a project looking at use, uh, using ponderosa pine in CLT. And the ponderosa pine is being taken out of Eastern Oregon uh, forests as part of forest restoration projects, looking at thinning forests to make them healthier and more resistant to these huge wildfires that we've had in the West, which you know have just been devastating for many, many, many reasons. Uh, we're also working with the state of California now. We're doing a testing project for them, um, looking at developing CLT out of some of their species that they're pulling out of forests for restoration. So we hope that in fact, we can find new uses for these small diameter logs that are coming out of these forests in the West, and again, help to reduce wildfire risks. Um, and then Professor Laurie Shimlick in Wood Science and Engineering at OSU did a project looking at using uh, recycled two by four studs on uh, demolished buildings in CLT. And in fact, it makes very nice CLT. These are, these are nice Douglas fir pieces. They, they, of course, have to have the nails removed first, which is a little bit of an expensive process. But, um, but again, they, they can make extremely nice um, uh, CLT panels. And then combining both the idea of reuse and design, we have a project going on now um, uh, uh, led by two of our UO Department of Interior Architecture faculty, Assistant Professor Corey Olson and Associate Professor Linda Zimmer. And they're looking at digital fabrication of furniture using CLT cutouts and offcuts of which we happen to have a whole bunch of them in our Emerson lab <laughs> left over from all kinds of testing projects that we have. So they took um, some CLT um, and cut out on the bandsaw a kind of rough outline of eventually what they wanted, uh, glued these panels together, and then transferred them to the KUKA station. 
uh, an eight axis uh, KUKA, uh, six axis plus, you know, the fact that it can move up and down in the track and rotate to the table. And that made, that took these rough cuts and made them into a much smoother cut. And they did a little bit of sanding. And um, this is the final project on casters. And they're doing a whole series of these, looking at what you can do. We've had some interest from a from a, a local manufacturer um, who's also interested in looking what you can do with these cutouts from you know, panels when you cut out doors and windows, um, as well as kind of off cuts. So we think this is an interesting direction. And the last project I'm gonna show you is actually one that I'm working on with Mark Fretz, who's um, this research assistant professor at U of O. And we've been looking at um, cluster workforce housing in Milwaukee. So I did a version of this um, in my design studio um, uh, about a year ago, looking at modular housing. And we're actually looking at making it panelized rather than volumetric, um, which we think is probably gonna be more efficient and um, able to be shipped to more places. So the city of Milwaukee is just outside Portland. And um, like a lot of places, housing has become essentially unaffordable for workforce, people earning 70% to 100% of area median income. So they're looking at upzoning um, single family housing to multifamily housing, something that Oregon wrote into law a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, there's been some resistance in neighborhoods, but, but Milwaukee is determined to implement this. And they did a cluster housing study looking at a site that um, Mark Fretz actually owns that we are looking at also. So we're working with Swinnerton uh, Mass Timber with William Silva and they have a new fabrication facility in North Portland that um, can fabricate mass plywood panels. We're working with Frere's Lumber, of course, in Frere's in, in Lyons, Oregon on the mass plywood panels. But interestingly, uh, Providence St. Joseph's Health System has gotten involved. They have a hospital that is just down the hill, essentially adjacent to the land we're looking at. And they have a piece of land just north of the one that Mark owns that they want to join into this group. Um, to expand its possibility and create some workforce housing for their nurses. And we've also are working with Jesse Ledesma of Shortstack Housing. It's an affordable housing developer. She's an affordable housing developer. And she has another lot um, a couple of blocks away that she wants to join in this development. So we're looking at developing maybe 20 to 30 two and three bedroom um, cluster houses, quite small, about 750 to 1100 square feet. Um, that um, we hope will be able to provide um, affordable workforce housing that will be able to do three things. Well, one is make it affordable and actually compete with stick built, which we think by using very thin panels, we might be able to do. Um, but by creating more demand for mass timber panels, that's more jobs in rural communities where there aren't any. Um, mass plywood in particular can use, uh, you know, they use veneers and they can use really small log diameters down to five inches, allowing for environmental stewardship of our forests. And if we can create affordable housing out of it, well, that's the trifecta that Oregon is really interested in. And uh, we have just started this project and hope to be able to report success within a year or so. Um, and uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Right, you covered you covered a lot in a, very quickly. I could tell you're a regular Zoom presenter. Um, perfect. Um, um, go ahead. Yes, that's true, Greg. I am a regular Zoom presenter. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a couple of questions and, and, and ask the audience to add more. Um, first one is from John Padilla. During online classes, how do you measure the level of student involvement? Timber design, wood construction, as any form of project, requires a lot of iteration, prototyping, and physical prototyping. Well, we did a lot of physical work in previous studios. Online, that's the one piece that's missing. But, um, you know, studio meets three days a week. And um, I meet with each of my students every single session to make sure that they're moving ahead. We also work with a lot of consultants. I, Michael Gershfeld, the, the professor I work with, has been coming in more frequently than he used to, um, partly because we do it virtually. And he is, you know, in the first um, nine weeks, he visited probably 12 times or more. Um, and we work individually with the students on their projects. We also have a mechanical engineer, Justin Stenkamp from PAE, who's working with us um, on, um, and is familiar with a lot of mass timber projects. So 
without the models, it's, it's much harder. But the project we're working on right now is a forest education center in the McDonald Forest, which is one of Oregon State University's research forests from the College of Forestry. So our client is um, Dean Tom DeLuca of the College of Forestry and Professor Stephen Fitzgerald, who um, uh, is the director of the McDonald Forest. So we have been able to visit the forest and visit the site, which is great, and learn a lot about their sustainable uh, management of that forest. Um, and we actually were also able to take um, a kind of a field trip. I, um, well, anyway, kind of unofficially, you know, people just travel there independently and look at a number of projects. We went to the Frere's facility, uh, which was great, but we also visited the Chemeketa um, Community College Ag Complex, which uh, Swinerton is constructing. FFA are, are the architects on that, and they have a big MPP uh, roof structure in it, and they talked to us about that in detail. And we also went to the new Santiam High School, which has an enormous mass plywood panel gym, which went up very quickly. So we were able to see some stuff in person. And in the spring, we'll probably be able to do more field trips. And that helps a lot. But it's it's tough um, compared to being able to like be in the workshop and build models and work with the material. It, it is challenging. And when we, we actually were supposed to launch the, um, the focus in mass timber design in the MS this year. And last May, I pulled the plug. I just thought starting it this year, let, you know, with pandemic was just not going to work. And the students who were about to start were disappointed, but they're all willing to start again in the fall and they're excited about it. And they agreed when I spoke to them about a month ago that it was the right decision to delay it for a year because we'll be able to involve them in hands-on education starting in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, from a question from Kelsey McLaughlin. Are any comparative metrics provided as part of the feasibility studies that help sway the client organization to commit to a mass timber solution, i.e. embodied carbon, cost construction time savings, et cetera? Yeah, and, and hi, Kelsey. Yes, as a matter of fact, um, the Clackamas um, Courthouse Project, um, they had a grant from uh, U.S. Forest Service through Wood Innovations to fund not only the studio, but to, to fund um, an LCA study. Um, which we did afterwards. So we did, um, we evaluate, we, we chose two of the projects and did a comparison um, of their um, mass timber structural systems to an equivalent one in concrete and equivalent one primarily in steel, uh, because we assume that, you know, everything else being equal. Um, and again, that was an LCA study that again revealed it depends what you count in terms of biogenic carbon. So we looked at a huge reduction potentially um, in, um, in greenhouse gas um, and, on carbon, and a huge increase in carbon sequestration. But again, you know, we showed that it depends on exactly what you count, which is why we're doing the Carbon Narratives Project. The projects you know, that we do in studios are basically design projects um, at, and they, they, they exist at a kind of conceptual level. So we can't really get to the level of costing it, though again, we, we actually did the LCA study for it. Um, we're actually hoping, and, and getting costing analysis has been difficult. It's something we've been struggling with because a lot of, a lot of projects do not want to re reveal costs, which is, which is an issue. We've been working with Swinerton has been really, really cooperative on several of their projects. And we're also working with beam development, um, hoping to get some costing studies that they're doing on some of their office buildings. Um, so we are hoping to get more costing studies. And if any of you are working on projects where you're willing to share that data with us, please let us know. And we will be able to then have more data that we can share with the public. Um, the LCA stuff, again, we're working to try to quantify with the Carbon Narratives Project. Perfect, thank you. Um, Gail Roberts asks, is anyone looking at making doors out of the door cutouts from CLT panels? Actually, um, we are looking at in this um, mass plywood panel cluster housing project, we're looking at making doors out of mass plywood panels um, um, and hopefully out of two inch plywood panels, which will not be nearly as heavy as, as CLT. You, you could certainly do it out of CLT, but even three ply CLT, that is a very, very, very heavy door. Um, and um, you can make it work, but it's it would take a certain amount of fairly expensive hardware. So I don't know that anybody is looking at it, at it but that is our plan for the cluster housing is to is to make um, uh, doors out of the same panels and the cutouts of the panels um, uh, uh, 
for the cluster workforce housing. So we hope in about a year or so, we'll be able to have some data on that and whether it's cost effective and, and how the hardware works. Mm -hmm. A question from John Padilla. For a young professional who wants to work in the timber wood design field, what are the skills you foresee are going to be needed in the next few years? Well, one, one thing you really need is to understand how to work in an integrated design team is that um, in all of my studios, I have a structural engineer, again, Michael Gershfeld, consult very early on so that instead of designing a building, which is what architects are kind of used to, and then thinking about the structural system, we have that there from the very beginning, right? And we also look at existing mass timber panels and what the sizes are. And for the modular projects, I had my students lay out in both CLT and MPP all the panels um, they were using and all the cuts they were making. So we start with the actual panel sizes that are manufactured in Oregon, and we look at those. And that's something that Swinerton is doing, is looking at not only the most efficient way to, to, to um, structure uh, a building in mass timber, but also at what kind of panel sizes are being made by which manufacturers and which is the, the kind of most optimal one to use. We're also working increasingly with mechanical engineer early because in integrating the mechanical systems early is also really critical in terms of figuring out how to do that pretty seam seamlessly versus trying to retrofit it and having a zillion holes in your you know, mass timber panels. So I think that the most important scale is learning to think holistically and integratedly about design where all the consultants, architects, um, uh, structural engineer, mechanical engineer, manufacturer, and also the contractor who has to bring all of this stuff together, all work together from the very beginning. And I think that's the most important thing is to really change the way of thinking about design as architects, to think about and also fabricators like cut my timber, um, <laughs> thinking about working with all of those um, basically industry stakeholders from the beginning and developers looking at costs is that you can't think about design as separate from thinking about all the disciplines that go into making a mass timber building. And I have, I have a question, Judith. There's so much going on at the Tolwood Design Institute, University of Oregon and Oregon in general in mass timber what would you recommend people do to keep track of all of those programs and those all of those that those involvement side? Well, they're all on our website. We actually um, on on the website we have um, the research projects listed. We have um, kind of summaries of them, but also you can contact the faculty who are involved in them for more information on any of those. And we have I don't know thirty fifty. I don't even know how many because every year we have more and more uh, projects going on. So we may be up to about 50 projects by now. Um, most of the studios are posted on the website. We're about to do a website overhaul. So the last couple of studios aren't posted yet. And we have um, these books that come out in the studios that are available for download. We also urge you to join our meetup group. Again, we have over 700 members now and we have monthly meetings. Actually in the fall, we had the more often than that. We usually have a faculty research symposium in the fall where people present the work that the, the Institute has funded. But because we weren't doing that in person, we combine that in the fall with our meetups. So we, we seem to have almost weekly meetings with the meetups presenting uh, both research from the Institute and uh, industry partners. But we're back to our kind of one, once a month presentations now with, with industry partners. And it'll be a combination of industry partners and work done by um, the Institute. So I think that um, those things are definitely there. And I also think that once we start our, um, our, our workshops again, that, that will be um, a design, our design build workshops, that will be an opportunity to actually come and spend three days with us in our lab in Corvallis, designing, fabricating and building um, a small structure out of mass timber. And we're looking forward to starting those again. We have some certificate programs that will be online and, um, you can always think about joining our Master of Science program, which we're launching. So there are a number of ways to, to come and get involved with, with the Institute and see what we're doing. Beautiful, Th thank you for your time. We've got another presentation coming up uh, at 10.30 PST. So I'll give everyone a break, but thank you again. And I'll try to get this uh, video up online within a week and then add some additional resources, including the, the websites you mentioned. Thank you again, Judith. Thank you, Greg.